Free Minds TV is here at the Peterborough Town Hall for Ron Paul's uh, campaign speech tonight. He's going to be fielding questions from the audience, uh, trying to answer questions for independents and undecided, and a lot of his fans have shown up as well. So hopefully we get some good footage for you and there's some good questions that he has to tackle as well. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Ron Paul. Specifically, to be an obstetrician. I know you were in, in the Air Force as a flight surgeon, but right. you decided to become an obstetrician. But when I finished medical school, it was in 1961. I went into further training at the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. I was doing internal medicine and going to general practice. But in uh, October of 1962, there was a, uh, a major event going on in our country, and that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Uncle Sam called me, and I was drafted. And uh, Actually, they sent me a draft notice, but they said if I volunteered, uh, instead of being a buck private in the Army, I could be a captain and practice medicine. So I said I volunteered immediately. <laughs> so, so I went in, in the Air Force. I wanted to be in the Air Force and practice uh, as a flight surgeon. Then when I got out, it was that time that I had uh, rethought my plans about what branch of medicine I wanted to go in and just decided I thought that uh, OB was a happy uh, branch of medicine. and. Uh, even though the hours can be long and sometimes uh, unusual. But it, it was, I think it was the attractiveness of the happy part of, of medicine and new life uh, was very exciting to me and it was just exciting. And I love medicine and uh, actually when I went into politics, it wasn't like I went into politics, it was just that I had gotten fascinated in uh, in, uh, in economics and I wanted to just speak out because even in the early 19s, uh, the free market economists were uh, predicting exactly the problems that we're facing today and, uh, uh, and it was that reason I just wanted to you know do something other than just medicine so that's when I ran for Congress was elected to Congress and uh, ended up being there longer than I thought. The, the final question is you know there's a financial crisis that's been unfolding in, in Europe and the Federal Reserve is starting to, starting to try to stem that with our dollars um, what do you think will happen with this and what kind of effect is this going to have on the American people? Well, are you in an optimistic mood tonight or a pessimistic mood? <laughs> Actually, it, it doesn't matter because I usually give the best straight answer I can. I think it's a mess. I think it's so much worse than they will admit to. I think that's why it's getting worse. It's been bad for four years. And this is why they won't look. If, if they knew what was really going on, they would cut spending. They wouldn't be proposing more spending. They talk about it because they know people like you are starting to say, hey, aren't you people spending too much money and why don't you balance the budget? But they're not talking about it. They're talking about cutting one trillion plus over, over 10 years. And uh, that is only a cut in the proposed increases. No absolute cuts. They're not even gonna start to over after 2013. And now we've bailed out just about everybody so far when it comes to the banks and the corporations. But now it's Europe. We're getting ready to bail out in Greece and, and Italy and Spain and all of Europe. But it can't be done. It's unsustainable. We've already been downgraded once and we're on the verge of having our credit rating downgraded again. But it's still the currency that people are hoping and praying will pull this all together. And the only thing they know how to do is create more money. And uh, but the markets are up and down. One day they make this announcement that they're going to get together and solve this problem. The market is up two, three hundred points. Then the next day they know it is not going to work, and then the markets go down. Uh, no, this is going to get much worse because they won't address the subject. They won't admit that government is too big and the debt is too big, and that all they offer is to, is to print more money. And, you know, today there was a there was a poll done today that I think was, and you'll probably see it on the news if you haven't seen it, which I thought was rather significant. They did a poll and asked the people who you're angry at. Everybody recognized we have a problem. Who are you most angry at? Are, is it the big, big, big corporations? Is it big labor or big government? 64% said it's big government. They fear big government. That is healthy. We're getting to the 
source of the problem. That's why I think the Tea Party movement and even the, a lot of what's going on in the Occupy movement, that's at least getting to the problem and saying, the people in Washington so far haven't solved it. We can't solve it with just conventional status quo stuff that they've been talking about for years and years because it's a lot more significant than this. But although I say it's a very, very big problem, I'm also very optimistic if we did the right things, we could be overdone with this in about a year, we could get back to working. If we get back to a sound currency and a sound market, and quit spending this money overseas and do the necessary things, it wouldn't take us that long to get back on our feet again. But what we're doing here is going to be prolonged. We're into it for four years already. Japan got into this mess 20 years ago and they still, they wouldn't get rid of the debt, they wouldn't pay it off, and they have all this debt floating around and they can't solve the problem. We did this during the Depression, the Depression lasted for 17 years. So if you do the right thing, if we as a country do the right thing and live within our means, it's just common sense, uh, yes, it would take about a year to do it, but then the people would go back to work again, just think there would be less government, less regulation, less taxes, and if I had my way, I'd get rid of the income tax and the Federal Reserve, and that would never happen. So now, now I want to open up to the audience for questions. And again, I, I, I um, again urge any Ron Paul supporters to let the undecided folks here uh, ask their questions. Um, and so uh, and I'll let Dr. Paul field his own questions and uh, pass this mic off. Hi, I'm a supporter of Dr. Paul. And I live in San Diego, California. And I, uh, the question that I hear most from people who are on the fence is, if you're going to cut all of this, all of these government jobs, then all those people are going to be out of business, out of, they'll be unemployed. How will they then become employed? And I'd like it if you could speak to that so that I could help speak to that. Because okay. California is, we need you. Yeah, okay. If uh, we get rid of five departments, there'll be some of the bureaucrats laid off, and they might have to go to work, we work for a living. <laughs> It's not a problem if you have the proper economic environment, sound money, balanced budgets, less regulations, low taxes, and the things that we would have to do. But we had, uh, when the Depression finally ended, which was 1946, after 16 years or so, uh, we'd gone into war, uh, and, um, and, and then at the end of the war, those, those liberal economists that I complain about said, oh, the Depression is coming back. We have to have jobs programs. 10 million military personnel were going to come back. Where are they going to get their jobs? And uh, they didn't have a time to set up their programs. And uh, so, and besides, we were spending too much money. The budget was cut 60%. Taxes went down 30%. 10 million people came back. And guess what? Everybody got a job. They went back to work. And we finally ended the Depression because we got rid of all the bad debt and the malinvestment that accumulated in the 20s that gave us our, our depression. So the, the, the jobs will be there if you create the right environment. But even my program, which is uh, the only significant program where there's real cuts, I do look at this. Like I said, I have priorities of people who are dependent on medical care and the elderly. We would want to take care of them. And they don't get laid off on one day. You know, it's not like like it was after World War II. There would be would be transitions, but they might have to work for less. I want to cut the, the other way. Do I get a trillion dollars cut? Is I go back to the year 2006 and use the budget figures then, and that's a big cut. But how many people complain our government was too small in 2006? So we can do that. Have to cut, and, and uh, some would be laid off, but. Economically, there's a big difference between a bureaucrat who hinders productivity versus people in the workforce actually producing things and goods and services. So there is a, a big economic benefit from people going into, into the real economy versus the people that work in Washington. Yeah. Before the giant housing bubble uh, collapsed, the investors had every reason to believe that these were rock solid investments backed by the uh, full credit and faith of the United States government, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were guaranteeing these mortgages. Um, 
Then once the, the uh, market collapsed, they formed this thing called TOC, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which you say you're against. I guess they call it the banking bailouts, uh, Occupy does. What would you have done differently to protect the investors, honor the government's commitment to guarantee those mortgages, and uh, recover the uh, housing market from Congress's foray into social engineering? Well, if, if the government was involved, they shouldn't be involved because that would help create the bubble. But if they were involved and made a guarantee, just as I want to try to protect the promise for Social Security beneficiaries, although that money is gone, I have to work on where I'm going to get that money. If they've made a promise, yes, we should try to, just like FDIC. FDIC, in a real free market, could be private, but it's not. It's government. It, all our deposits are protected. Yes, we could honor that and honor a government guaranteed mortgage, but that's not where the money went. The money went to these guys that got into the derivatives business and did all the speculating. That's what they were doing. And they were making a bundle and they, got, they went broke. So it was the banks and big corporations as well as our car companies. So that TARP funds, as well as what the Federal Reserve did, bailed those people out. And the middle class that we were supposed to be trying to protect and make sure they all had a house, they ended up losing their job, and yes, indeed, they, they didn't pay their mortgages, you know, and they did. They lost their houses. So the whole thing was created by the government, and then they bailed out the wrong people, and the program that was designed to help people get a house actually backfired. So it's, it, this is why I'm saying the system we have today is every bit as vulnerable as the communist system was because it was way over the top on socialism. Ours is sort of a, a guarantee system, but the wealth is gone from this country, and that is where the problem is. But uh, no, when you when the government makes a guarantee we should try our best, then I, I, we should try to work our way out of it. But my fear is that if we don't do what I suggest, they're going to just print money. Every other candidate is saying they're not even, like I said, they're not even talking about cutting anything before 2013. So that means they're going to run up more debt, they're going to print more money, the uh, credit rating is going to go down, and you're not going to have oil at 100. They're talking about going into Iran. To, you know, not, not that we don't have an infant wars going on, and they're talking right now, Syria is the next country they're going into, and then it's going to be Iran. And today, the, the Iranians are surrounded and they're threatened and sanctions are putting on. They say, well, look, what you're ganging up on us. We're going to be doing our darndest because we're capable of closing the Straits of Hormuz. And 40 or 50 percent of the oil comes out through there. They're capable of closing it. Then you're going to see $200 of uh, uh, oil price. So this is the reason that we have to cut the spending and get our house in order. And to do that, uh, in order to help the people here at home, we also have to have a sensible foreign policy. And I say, if you want to save this country and save our system and cut spending, let's bring our troops home. Could you explain the difference between isolationism and protectionism? And people are isolationism and protectionism. <laughs> so people are, are charging you with being a protectionist. In, in okay, okay. Isolationism and the other word that they use is interventionism, not protectionism. Okay. Uh, yes, I. You've heard a little bit about what I talk about: foreign policy, bring the troops home, mind our own business you know, and protect this, this country. And they say, oh, you're an isolationist. You don't want to be engaged around the world. Uh, and, and yet, those same individuals that say that I'm an isolationist are the very first ones who want to put on tariffs and sanctions on the country, which is an, uh, an abuse of free markets. And they're the isolationists. They're still the ones who want to have sanctions on Cuba. I say, let's, let's, let's finish that fight with Cuba. It's over. Let's start trading with Cuba. I call my program non-intervention. 
I don't believe we should be involved in the internal affairs of other nations. I don't think we should be the policemen of the world. We should try our best to get along with anybody who wants to be friends and trade with us. That's what the founders advised. We don't have the authority in the Constitution to do anything more. So under those conditions, it's quite a bit, uh, bit different. The one thing that is very much involved in trade and internationalism now is the fact that we have not only deferred from the Congress and passing the authority to the executive branch and taking over trade, it's going from the executive branch and from our government even into the WTO to run you know, trade policies in the United Nations. So I don't like that either. If I don't like Washington, you know what I might think about the United Nations and I am in the World Bank. I don't think we should be messing with them either. lowest tariffs as possible because tariffs are taxes and, the, and uh, the people people have to pay them. I mean, if you can buy a product uh, at a better rate someplace, you should have the right to do it in a free society. If you had free markets and we had a healthy economy, nobody would be worrying about that. But we're moving now into an age of this financial crisis. They're having these competitive devaluations, make a weaker currency here, try to stimulate trade back and forth, and then they come in with tariffs and, and uh, a lot of protectionism, and that too often leads to, to war, and that's why markets, uh, we see right now we're less likely to fight with China than we were when I was in high school, because uh, we weren't trading with them. Now we trade with them, and the likelihood is much less. So the founders were right. The more you trade and talk with people, the less likely you are to fight with them. That's why I don't like the sanctions, and I don't like that. But to call that uh, isolationism is, is probably the most absurd charge I've ever heard because they're the ones who believe in mercantilism and protectionism and sanctions. Um, my question is, when you become president, what will be the first thing you do to shrink government and, you know, help out this country? Okay, uh, what's the first thing I would do as president? Well, um, you, you can't do things in one day. You still have to, uh, you know, recognize there is a Congress, you're not a dictator. But you are the commander in chief of the military, and you could send a powerful message to the world that we're done doing all this stuff overseas. Stop the drones, stop the bombing, bring the troops home, let all our military come home and spend their money at home, which would be a stimulus for us. But then the, the next goal would be the things I'm talking about, you know, more oversight of the Federal Reserve, having uh, competing currencies, balance the budget, cut the spending, get rid of five departments, there's so many. But the president has, uh, Authority to, to inform policy. But he also has authority uh, to, he can't, I don't believe the president should write laws like they do. They write regulations. I don't think the executive branch should write regulations. That's the Congress's problem. So you can deal with the regulations. I don't believe the um, president should write executive orders to write regulations and laws either. But I do believe the president has the authority to repeal the, the uh, executive orders that had been written has caused so much harm. So you can do a lot of things, but the most important thing would be sending a message. Sending a message. Right now the message is all, <coughs> all negative. We're going to be in endless wars forever. We're going to be spending forever. There's no offering on how to cut <coughs> balance budget. So that would, be, that would be the most important thing, to send the message that things would change. Thank you. I'm a registered nurse from Massachusetts in maternal child health, and my biggest question for you is how you would reduce America's reliance on prescription drugs, especially in children, and um, allowing people to be more focused on holistic health and taking care of the problem rather than medicating themselves and becoming zombies. No. <laughs> Just reducing America's reliance on prescription medication oh, as a whole. Reliance on prescription medication. <laughs> You know, I just uh, did a weekly report, I do a weekly report on, on a telephone message, and I dealt with uh, this compulsion and the desire to have mandatory health screen tests for every kid in school. And this would mean that maybe 10 or 20, oh, they've done some test studies on this, 10 or 20 percent of the kids would be put on uh, psychotropic drugs. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, so if, if this is helpful and should be done, it should be done with the doctor and the patients and the parents. 
but this mandatory testing and, and the use of these medications, I, I think in this country we've gone way off track on the, on the use of medications. I don't, I don't like our war on the illegal drug because I think it's a waste of money and never did any good. It's a big problem. and more abuses. I think the doctors are way too careless on this. And the responsibility should be on us. I mean, we have to make our decisions on most dangers in life, personal decisions made, whether it's alcohol or whatnot. But this idea that the FDA is going to take care of us, uh, they end up interfering with choices. Uh, we have less choices now because the drug companies are promoting some drugs. They're the ones who are in action. They're the big lobbyists. When there's, when there's medical reforms in Washington, whether it, it's the Republican prescription drug programs or the Democrats' Obamacare, the drug companies, insurance companies, they're the big lobbyists and they, they promote things. And they also prevent and would like to regulate all alternative care and vitamins and nutritional products and keep people from it. So my ideal, as a symbol of moving in a different direction, I would like to restore your right to drink raw milk anytime you want to drink. It's very difficult to live within your means. Um, my question is, you want to allow workers to opt out of Social Security, your campaign event back in June 22nd, 2011. Uh, since current retirees rely for their benefits on the taxes collected from today's workers, how could your plan avoid endangering the retirement security of older Americans? Okay, I, I've, touched, I've touched on that, but I said if we don't do anything, it's all gone. Your education, your medical benefits, your social security is all gone because you just can't keep printing money. It's already being under attack. The people you are wanting to protect, social security benefits are going down. You say, what do you mean? They go up a little bit. They didn't go up for a couple years. They went up a little bit this year. But you're not keeping up with the inflation. The real, uh, real costs, uh, the real benefits now are going down. The standard of living is going down for people on Social Security. This is why I talk about monetary policy. You have to quit printing the money so that the money doesn't lose value because that's how they cheat people and they diminish it. And I've talked about exactly what you're, you're mentioning. Uh, and that is the only way that you can take care of people because I do think that this is a flawed system, but I want to work our way out of it. But one of the things is to work it out, work our way out of it and have a sound economic system, I want to allow, like she suggested, I want to allow anybody 25 or under to get out of Social Security and take care of themselves the rest of their life. Still, the question that I haven't answered yet, partially before I did, is how are we going to do it? How are we going to tie the people over? How are we going to make sure? There is no money in Social Security. They're all IOUs. They're depending on future taxation and, uh, and borrowing money. So my idea is, where are you going to cut it? I said, don't cut Social Security. Don't cut medical benefits. Cut these wars. To cut this $1.4 trillion overseas that we're spending. Yeah. We don't need to do that. people in a transitional way. Dr. Paul, thanks for coming. Peterborough. I'm an independent, not undecided, and I know looking around, there are many of us here. The question is not whether I, speaking for me, question your platform at all. It's about whether it's actionable. You face in the office pretty bitterly divided Congress. How do you build consensus? To put, your, to put your ideas rubber on the road, and please, give us concrete examples. Okay, uh, you, you know, he wasn't overly critical, I'm not really critical of what I'm saying, but how do you do it? How do you accomplish it? How do you bring people together? Uh, and, and it is the key, that's what has to be done. 
I think if we don't do something like this, of course, what I've said so many times, it, things deteriorate and they get much worse, and so we have to do something. But how are we going to do this? Um, people say that what you have to do is compromise so you can get in incrementalism. But I don't think it's compromise that we need because we made compromise for five decades. And the people who like to spend the money on the military compromise with the people who like to spend the money on, on other welfare programs. And they come together and they keep compromising and, and spending more money. So we have to reverse that psychology and start cutting. So uh, in Washington, uh, I probably work, uh, as a Republican, I probably work with Democrats as, as well, if not better than than any of the rest, because I take a different position. Uh, there aren't that many Republicans who want to bring the troops home, but I think the American people want to bring the troops home. So I think the and uh, also, I have a strong emphasis on uh, on civil liberties. I already mentioned the uh, the war on drugs. I I don't think the president should be running your life and telling you how to live. So you get people to come together who aren't traditionally in one category. Bringing people together is not difficult if you understand what freedom is all about. Freedom brings people together, people that are diverse, and people are tolerant, should be tolerant of other people, just like we're tolerant of people's religion, but we need to be more tolerant of people's individual activity and their lifestyle. So we bring people together to understand this. What happened, and I'm trying to reverse the course of history in many ways, because what happened 100 years ago, we had a group of people say, you know, economic liberty is a good idea, and personal liberty is a good idea, and some other people are defending that, but they're one and the same. You have a right to your life. It's a natural right to your life and your liberty. You ought to have a right to keep, you know, the fruits of your labor. And we shouldn't divide this up. So I think it's a matter of talking to people and working with people and bringing people together who understand civil liberties and foreign policy and coming together with the absolute necessity uh, to do something with our budget. So uh, all I can say is it's very, very clear. You have to talk to people. You have to work with people. You have to understand the Constitution. But you have to sell people on this idea, on the idea that freedom works. It's worked in this country better than any other country ever. We had the best test of it. We had the largest middle class in the history of the world, and it's going away. The middle class is disappearing, and uh, the necessity is there. So I think the people are listening right now more than they ever have before. I've been talking about this for a long time, and uh, it's just in the last couple of years that all of a sudden something is happening in this country because I think most people uh, are very much aware of the fact that these conditions are very, very serious and they're very open now to come together. That's the best I can tell you, but I do know that the best way to bring people together is not to tell people how to be more aggressive in cutting up a pie that is shrinking, but rather than, to cut and, rather than emphasizing expand more freedom so the pie keeps getting bigger. Thank yeah. you very much. That about does it for the question and answer session uh, tonight for Ron Paul. I'd love to try to get a one-on-one -on -one interview with him, but I don't think we're going to because uh, there's a long line of people trying to get pictures with him and getting him to sign things. So we would be here for a very long time if we were going to try to get an interview, um, which I don't think is happening. But hopefully um, this special has been enlightening for you, has answered some questions for you. Maybe if you didn't know about Ron Paul or really understand some of his positions, you'll understand them a little bit better now. So that's going to do it for us tonight here on Free Minds TV.